the uh, site I'm talking about is uh, Bradgate Park. It's situated uh, just about 15 kilometres northwest of Leicester City. Um, it's uh, a public park. It's open to the public, or much of it is. Um, it's a historic park in that it was the seat of uh, the Gray family, and much of the park as it exists today still has the ruins, uh, early post medieval ruins of the, the Gray family uh, country residents. And it's basically been a deer park um, since the 12th century, and it's, it's been maintained, although it's an open park, it's maintained as a working deer park. It's got uh, two herds. Road deer herd of about 300 individuals, which is um, a very common sight within Bradgate Park, and a smaller herd of 100 red deer, um, which you don't see very often, but uh, I'll come on to that. Um, I should have said that the site was first located by a couple of local um, field workers, the amateur archaeologists who were out one weekend taking their niece on a, on a, on a walk and she was clambering over some rocks. And being uh, field workers, um, doing lots of field walking around the, uh, uh, the Leicestershire countryside, they, they, they recognised some uh, work flints that was coming up in a, a very localised area. And I was lucky enough to be one of the first to look at this and recognise that it was it's very likely uh, later to a Paleolithic. So, a really general re relief map there, and I'm showing you the, uh, the East Midlands regions, a number of counties that make up the East Midlands. And uh, the also, I'm showing uh, the area of Charmwood Forest, which sounds very rural, but actually it's got the M1 running through the middle of it. Um, but there are there are bits of this landscape. It's a sort of mini uh, mini upland land landscape in, in, in pretty much a flat clayland uh, county. Um, so an aerial slide here of, of Bradgate Park, and you can see the modern agriculture just outside. And here's the the village of Newtown Linford. But all this area is basically the original deer park. Uh, it's been encroached upon by a reservoir, a 19th century re reservoir, Croxton there. And I'm going to be talking about some general landscape, very local units. Uh, the story really is about this gorge, Little Matlock Gorge, which is a, a, a nod to Matlock Gorge in Derbyshire, which is a, quite an ironic nod because this is much <laughs> smaller. Um, then we have the, 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 the rugged uplands of, of, of Charmwood uh, within the park. Um, most famously, there's uh, a site there which is Old John, that's a bit of a Leicestershire landmark. And the accessible park is, is gained from uh, an entrance here, this is one of the entrances, and you can travel through the gorge on foot and you can access all the rugged uplands to the north. There's a small area here, just on the south side of the gorge, which is called the Deer Sanctuary. And um, this is basically where the red deer hang out most of the year. Uh, there is no public access. It's a controlled herd, so there is, uh, there's some uh, culling that goes on every year uh, to maintain the herd. And a typical shot, we're looking there at a folly at the top of Old John. Looks rather like a beer mug and there's a war memorial there. But you get an idea of the uh, craggy uplands. Whereas if we go into the Little Matlock Gorge, um, it starts to look a little bit more Jurassic Park than uh, Bradgate Park. Uh, so we've got a mixture of, of, of oak, but also you can see there's monkey puzzle trees and everything. And you can see the or not see, one of the problems is there is so much vegetation cover here um, that uh, really it's, it's quite inaccessible and it's quite difficult to see. But anyway, we've traced my steps. 
Well, the site was originally found in 2001, and although we made some attempts to gain access and to get some funding for further work, uh, this, for various reasons, wasn't forthcoming. Until there was a change in management of the park, and in 2013, the new manager, Peter uh, Tillersley, um, was beginning to uh, get information together to formulate a parkland management plan, a stewardship scheme uh, to look after the park. And uh, that uh, benefited from European funding at the time, five year programme. And we were brought in straight away the known of the Paleolithic site. It was on the historic environment record, and that was near the top of priorities. But one of the other things it was to do was to um, assess the other heritage uh, assets of, of the apartment. And as well as the <coughs> early um, evaluation work at the Paleolithic site, Running concurrently with that was also some uh, more extensive surveys, including uh, a LIDAR survey. And um, this is a very, very cleaned up LIDAR image. So we've taken all the vegetation off most of the modern buildings are off. You can still see uh, the modern village down here. But uh, we're seeing all the, all the relief unvegetated and here we are with the little map of gorge with the river Lynn flowing through there uh, into Hobson Reservoir or originally flowing into the Saw itself a tributary of the Trent and of course the, the dot is the fine spot of the finds, the initial finds. And just a little bit of playing with the LIDAR uh, data to, to give you some idea. Um, as well as providing a, 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 a background and a cleaned up um, palette of what was there, um, it also allows me to talk a little bit about the local topography. Um, lots of other things came from the LIDAR survey. You see the field systems and whatever, there's enclosures, all sorts. And at about the same time, a decision was made that for Bradgate Park to be um, investigated by the field school um, from the university, um, a five-year programme of works mainly looking at uh, the medieval and post-medieval remains, but uh, as we'll see, also throwing up some information on a Paleolithic archaeology. So 2014, um, we knew where the site generally was. It seemed to be very localised. It's just above the floodplain. Uh, the slide here is looking is, is, is on the very end of the uh, of the gorge. We're looking at the final outcrop before we're onto the floodplain. And in the background is the post-medieval ruins of Bradgate House. We sunk some 22 pits, mainly at a five metre interval, and these quite successfully showed um, that. Uh, it was, a, it was a fairly small scout, it seemed to be sort of six to eight metres across uh, with a rapid fall off. A balance of tools, we were getting cheddar points, scrapers, pierces, and uh, we were able to provide the sedimentary context as well. We were in a head deposit, the Charnwood head deposit, which is quite extensive across much of Charnwood, unsurprisingly. Um, this was looked at by Sam Steen for uh, sedimentological purposes and it seems to have had some antiquity and it's, it's very likely that the original scatter uh, was on the surface and has subsequently moved down profile. I'll go into that in a bit more detail in a sec. Um, for those of the lithic persuasion, those two cheddar points um, were not damaged in this not casting <laughs> So to just go back, I'm, re I'm repeating what all the speakers have said here, but I'm using this familiar side, slide because it's, it's very useful. Um, Bradgate is number 35. I've, I've loosely grouped these up into um, some of the, the our sites and included the, uh, the continental outliers, maybe. Oh. 
So it seems, even from the initial surface collection, it seemed to be a, a good final Magdalenian Creswellian collection, and uh, it could join several of the, the cave sites. And again, repeating what has, has more or less been said, so I'll, I'll, I'll go over this quite quickly, but my main point here is when we're looking at the, uh, the new AHOP dates, is that we're given a slightly longer chronology, and I think we can start to see our final Magdalenian Creswellian as something that has perhaps been there a little bit longer than we uh, previously thought. Um, perhaps with a long chronology that would allow um, some developments as well. So there was enough information from the test pit evaluation and a decision was made that we would try to, we would undertake a rescue excavation. Um, from 2001 up to the present, the site has suffered rather horribly. Um, principally here, uh, I'll just explain that on this site, we're looking at a partly managed site. Until a few years ago, all this brown area was high bracken, made to access across the, this bit of the, the landscape, this, bit, this mouth of the gorge, quite restricted. So people tended to walk along this path here, and in fact this wasn't there, this, this gorge wasn't there in 2001. Um, that's been exacerbated by uh, uh, off-road cycling and um, so the, the threats to this site were considerable and a decision was made to excavate an area, it was roughly uh, 80 square metres and we agreed to take it down to a level that wouldn't be affected by, um, by footfall, by the erosion of footfall. <coughs> um, Straight away, we were, we were picking up lots of flint um, right at the surface, uh, we expected that. What we didn't quite expect was um, the sedimentology of the site, how quickly it changed. What we were coming down onto on, the, on this side, the southern side of the site, was a talus deposit, which is coming off the outcrop, and that slopes down um, and the head deposits here are actually considerably deep and we didn't get to dig all of that. We just took it down, we took 15 spits down at 20 millimetres, so about 300 millimetres down across that area. And just a, a, the opposite view of the site quite early on, just after a few spits. Um, oodles of flint. It's uh, yeah, just, just about 12,000 pieces that I've looked at in terms of debitage. Um, things I would point out is the raw material. We've got a couple of rather lovely blade cores there. Um, it looks to be quite dark, of Cretaceous flint. Smaller nodules, um, some of these show uh, wind-blown surfaces. Uh, it's likely that much of this stuff was picked up from glacial till uh, from east of England or possibly even the Lincolnshire and uh, Yorkshire coast, coastal area. We have a very high degree of fragmentation, lots and lots of pieces are broken, so a lot of what's down there is fragments, 4,000 odd, uh, many of those are just broken blades. But this isn't to say it's a particularly trampled site. Often the blades are broken, but they have very good uh, margins. Uh, they're not knit, they're not worn by uh, movements, excessive movements through the soil. Um, I should also say uh, we, did, we changed slightly our methodology. We started off wet sieving everything and it was far too long took too long. Anyway, I've got quite a few things to get through in five minutes. So a quick look at the tools. Um, lots of tools, lots of broken tools, mainly uh, points, abruptly modified pieces, followed by becks, there's a lot of pierces as well, um, but more or less the full range of 
Creswellian, late Magdalenian, final Magdalenian tools. Um, mostly broken. These are the best ones in terms of the points that uh, I've illustrated. Um, where we do have complete or near complete points, they tend to be cheddar points. We have a couple of confirmed Creswell points, but I should also point out we have curved back elements, including a rather strange little one by itself down here, which does look a little bit like one of the pieces from Goffs. And we have microburins. We've got Krakowski pieces, and we've also got a dozen microburins. And uh, rather like the Hamburgian, I think it's, it's deliberately uh, a technique being deliberately used in the manufacture of points. Numerous specks and pierces. Uh, looking at some of the large pieces there, um, some of these are reused tools. There's this one here seems to have been used as a knife, uh, and then it's resharpened uh, into a beck. Most of the becks are broken. End scrapers and burins, again, quite large amounts of these. Uh, the example you can see on top left has had a little bit of preliminary uh, use, wear, use analysis work on it, showing three different areas of polish. A scraping polish where you'd expect it, um, cutting uh, evidence along its margins, and some possible hacking polishing um, at its base. One of the first things to establish is okay, we're in a primary context, but is it in situ? I've already mentioned the good um, quality of the, the tools. Uh, even when they're broken, they tend not to have uh, damaged margins. Looking at one of the squares in the middle of the, the scatter, uh, the size profile is also very suggestive of, of, of um, uh, an assemblage which hasn't gone very, very far. It's not a dumped assemblage. It's uh, got a high tool complement. Um, we've got uh, many, nearly all elements of, of blade decotage. Perhaps lacking is definite evidence of manufacture of large blades. Um, which uh, another site I've looked at, Wayman Farm, he showed that many of the large blades were made using the air for on technique with a soft organic hammer, whereas the medium sized and smaller blades, many of which have been used for points, are being made with um, soft stone cushion. So I'm just going to rattle through some of the plots. This is a distribution plot, but I'm going to just show some density plots. You'll see in all lithics, uh, I hope the grey ones show up sufficiently, uh, the red pieces, about 20% of the decotage is burnt. So some density plots, there's four ones I'm showing in one here. Looking at the, the burnt pieces, you can see that sort of fan-shaped um, plan form. If we drill down into that and look at the more heavy burnt pieces, the calcined, uh, we think it's quite localised and we, we were happy enough to draw a conjectured half. And now if you look at the cores, um, the next one, uh, they're quite well distributed, uh, some distance from the putative half. Um, distribution plot on the right hand side of that, it, it does actually show quite a convincing arc, which may well be uh, tracing the line of the tent room. And we'll move on to the pieces, the abruptly modified pieces, the points. Quite well spread, but outside the hearth. I'm going to run through these because I've obviously missed time. I might talk slightly. Um, some of the other major pieces, uh, tool types. Again, hearth focus, but showing differences. And back to the excavation. Um, I don't want to draw a definite analogue here, but one of the interesting things, we were there in August, as you see from the vegetation. We didn't see any road, the red deer when we first got there, but as we get, approach the rutting season, uh, the red deer begin to cross, it's the crossing, it's an annual event, um, and they come over from the high uh, ground of the sanctuary onto the floodplain. 
Now, if you just, this is this shot's taken from my outside, so we're slightly elevated for the flood plane. If you'll just notice where that large herd of deer are, I'm going to point something out. And in the background, the other um, stone outcrop and the, the post medieval ruins itself. We've had students looking at each of these areas in different uh, seasons of field work. Um, and we've got Creswellian final Magdalene material from virtually every intervention. We've got it from, we have a Mag Magdalene blade from just outside the, the ruins, the outcrop there. We have excavating post medieval linen deposits we are finding flint work. Uh, there was a moated site, which is probably a lodge keeper's cottage, which was under excavation, and that's just, I've only just looked at this uh, in the last week or so. That produced a lovely uh, blade core and uh, a piercer as well, which looks to, to be Creswellian. So, in terms of where would I go looking for this sort of material, I know I've, I've, in the park where I've been looking for it, I've been concentrating on this club playing area and its margins, but uh, I'm going to cut short, there was a bit of video there, but I'll leave it at that. All right, thanks very much.